Happy Holy Thursday. I want to begin just by thanking you for being here this evening and taking uh, the time to make this week holy, a week that is set apart, a week that is different. And as we celebrate this Holy Thursday, uh, it is always a tremendous joy. As you know, I love being a priest, and this night when the sacrament of the Eucharist and the priesthood is instituted, uh, it is a tremendous joy to celebrate it with all of you, and I, I genuinely mean that. Thank you. This past summer, we had a tremendous opportunity. Over 120 images of the Last Supper were at our parish at our three summer festivals. For ourselves and for those who came to our religious exhibit, our non-threatening evangelization, it was profound. I would like in a certain way to evoke that again. I have a visual aid this evening. It is actually one of the images that was on display this summer at the campuses is a tapestry of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. If you guys, gentlemen, can hold it up a little higher. Your arms are going to get really tired. Uh, might be best to come in front of the angels so that they can, there we go, good. Okay, you can hold it down a little bit maybe, there you go. Painted originally in 1495 in a convent in the dining room it is 15 feet by 29 feet. It's massive. This tapestry or this rug hanging reminds us of its beauty and its importance. It is claimed to be one of the most replicated images of a painting in the world. As we look at this image, of course, and for those of you who remember the guided tour that we had this summer, I always tell people to look for certain people. I say, of course, whenever you see an image of the Last Supper, first identify Jesus, then look for Judas, then Peter and John. Tonight, I would like to have us cast our eyes on four individuals. You should always cast your eyes on Jesus. But I'd like to look at four of the disciples tonight. Jesus says tonight in that upper room, in this very room, he says, this is my body given up for you. In doing so, he turns bread and wine to his flesh and his blood. And in doing so, he also teaches us what it is to love. To love is to give yourself away. To love is to say, this is my body given up for you. To love is... is to offer. So let's look at four characters and how Jesus loved them, how Jesus gave them his body and blood, and how we are called to do the exact same. With John, I want to look at love. With Peter, I want to look at entrusting. In Thomas, I want to look at believing in. And in Judas, I want to look at being hurt. Directly to Jesus' right is John, the beloved disciple. John, the beloved disciple, is referred to in sacred scripture as the one whom Jesus loves. Jesus loved John, the beloved disciple. And when Jesus says, this is my body given up for you, he's saying that to one whom he loves. As you heard me say in several homilies since this, this summer of shame and the scandal among bishops and priests, John is our hero. John is the faithful priest who remained at the crucifixion, who didn't abandon our Lord. Because he loved, he was loved and he responded with love. And Jesus said to him in the room that night, John, this is my body given up for you. 
John, here is my flesh and blood. So I want to ask you tonight, who do you love? I hope that for those of you who are married, your first thought was your husband or your wife. For those of you who know the theology of the body, what do we believe about marriage? What do we believe about the marital embrace? What do we believe? This is my body given up for you. Husbands and wives are called to literally give themselves to each other. This is my flood. This is my blood. And even if you're not married, who do you love? Because if you love someone, it means that you are willing to lay down your life for them. It means that you are willing to give everything over to them. So how do you do that? How are you doing with that? Can we learn from the master? Next, I want you to look at Peter. Peter is next in line on that right side. What's interesting about Peter is you have to look, Peter is reaching around Judas. And what is in Peter's hand? How do you actually know that it is Peter? What is in Peter's hand? A sword, a dagger. Why? And, and, and how do we know that this is Peter? What does Peter do in the Garden of Gethsemane? He cuts off the high priest's ear. Are people not seeing this? Here's Peter. This is John. Here's Peter. Here's the, here's the knife. This is Judas. We'll be talking about him in a second. So John, Peter, Peter's arm, and the knife. Okay. Why does Peter have a knife? Where, where are we going to go directly after this Mass? To the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens to the Garden of Gethsemane? What, what does Peter do? He cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. Peter was always the first to speak. Peter was always the first to act. That's why he was entrusted with the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's why he was entrusted with the keys to the church. So Jesus tonight in that upper room says to Peter, Peter, this is my body. Give it up to you. Jesus entrusted to Peter his body and his blood, just as he entrusted to him the church so who do you entrust to? Many of you who have children, many of you who are parents, in our world today, the role of grandparents is epically changed. As more and more parent, grandparents are entrusted with the care of their grandchildren. But who has been entrusted to you? And who do you entrust your life to? Peter is willing to entrust the church to surrender and to give. We who have children and grandchildren, in a tremendous way, you are given such an amazing gift and it has been entrusted to you. What a blessing that is. John love, Peter in trust, and Thomas. Thomas is to the immediate left of our Lord. How can you identify Thomas? By his finger. Thomas is the one who has his finger in the air. Why is Thomas's finger in the air? As a reminder that in this very room, in this very room, Thomas will take that finger and he will probe the nail marks in Jesus' hands, his feet, and his side. And why does Jesus come that night? Because he wasn't there, Thomas was not there the first night that Jesus arose, arrived in the room. And a whole week later, Jesus comes back. 
Why does Jesus come back? Because he believes in Thomas. I have found as a coach that there are a lot of people in our world that thinks that nobody believes in them. And it's terribly sad. Jesus gives us his body and his blood. And he says to Thomas on this night, Thomas, I believe in you. This is my body. This is my blood. And he pours himself out. Who in your life do you believe in? Who in your life is God calling you to encourage? To hold up and to lift up? Who in your life is longing to be affirmed? We are called to say to them, this is my body, this is my blood. And I want to encourage you. Last, if you go back over to the right side of the painting between John and Peter is Judas. Judas has a money bag in his hand. And in the tapestry, the colors are a little off, but if you look at his elbow, there's a red splotch in the actual painting of Leonardo. What that red splotch is, is Judas spilling the salt on the table. If you've ever heard, if you've ever knocked over a salt shaker and someone says, oh, that's bad luck, don't spill the salt. Do I know why that is? Because of Judas. But what does it mean? Why did Leonardo paint Judas spilling the salt? Because in ancient times, salt was a commodity. It was used as money. The word salary comes from the Latin word sale, which means salt. People were paid in salt. Judas spilling the salt at the dinner table is a symbol of Judas spilling money to ultimately betray and turn over our Lord. When Jesus says that we are called to be the salt of the earth, he's saying that we are rich, that we are worthy, and that we are worth something. And Jesus says to Judas, who will betray him and hurt him, He says, Judas, this is my body, and I give it to you. He says, Judas, give me your feet, and I will wash them. And Jesus teaches us to love those that hurt us, to forgive them. In John, we find the courage to love in Peter the power to entrust in Thomas the hope to believe and inspire and encourage others and in Judas the reminder to forgive. In this very sacred room 2,000 years ago, Christ instituted the priesthood and he instituted the Most Holy Eucharist which calls every single one of us to serve in love and in trusting and believing and in forgiving. Let's pray that on this most holy night that we may do that. And let's pray that the grace of this night may inspire us to love, to entrust, to believe and to forgive. That the body and blood of Christ may lead us to eternal life. Amen.